I'm talking about quite an exotic topic. It's called continuous computing here. Um, we already heard the term analog computing. But let me first tell you why I want to talk about this today. So it was like two weeks ago I got a baby. And incidentally, her name is Ada. Uh, you probably know the programming language Ada or the analytical engine, which was co-engineered but somewhat by Ada Lovelace almost well, 100, 200 years ago. It was the first digital computer by modern definition. And this thing is uh, its actually twofold. So on one side, this is about digital versus analog. On the other side, I want to talk about why I fear about the future of my baby. And this is the fact that we have a problem with the digital bird, a problem which is probably not that uh, aware. We are not uh, that aware of this problem, but it's showing increasingly in several uh, dimensions. So the thing is that computing takes energy, and um, you can basically uh, explain that mostly by, by, this, um, by the clock of the digital computer, um, which cannot increase so much anymore. And if you want to go into the details on the technical level, it's a fact what we're seeing with Moore's law, which is still ongoing, but on a thing of thread performance of every single processing core, there has been a stagnation since almost 20 years. So um, we are somewhat cut with a frequency we can turn on digital computing, and this is really a performance stopper, so kind of a showstopper for getting more performance in digital computing. And actually, something which, is, which people in high-performance computing and in academia got first aware of, but nowadays it's even showing when doing artificial intelligence computations, for instance, which are really limited, by the way, how we build computers, and it's very hard to get an advance in that respect. And on the other hand, um, on even a more theoretical level, you can show, and this is kind of a fatalistic graph, that somehow the growth in digitalization in the, within the next years will not go on the way it does until now. So this is an, an exponential graph here, and you see that um, the, num the, the energy consumption by, by information processing, basically, is really growing on an unstopped level within the last uh, decades. And if it would grow the same, then within a, a few decades, actually <laughs> 10 years or 15 or so, uh, you, you would consume already what is today the global energy consumption. So this is a really weird uh, thing because, I mean, on one hand, we are in an information society. We want to consume information because we can use it for the good. But on the other hand, we really get into trouble because we have, uh, at some point, generate a lot of energy just for, energy, for information processing. And this is already visible today, where we have um, cornerstone numbers like 7% of global energy consumption going to, to the IT sector, or the global IT sector carbon footprint is comparable to the uh, global aviation today. And as I said, it will go somewhere where we really have an impact also on climate change. So. What is actually the way, where, where to go? Well, we say there is a solution, and the solution is actually on top of everybody's neck, on, within everybody's uh, head here in this stage. It's, it's a brain, right? Because if you look how nature computes, and I think we can all agree that the brain is quite a capable computer, um, it is completely different than the way how our processing technologies work. And if you look how, how the computing processors are, are working, there are these small hot things, these microprocessors within the surface temperature of the sun, really having trouble to get off all this heat. On the other hand, this brain, which is quite not that dense, which requires um, not that much energy, it's like about 20 watt compared to 200 and, 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 and much more watt. Um, of a CPU, um, and on, on the scale of a power density, it's even more dramatic. And on the other hand, the brain is quite slow. And this is, I think, the, the very uh, interesting fact that how it's possible to compute such amazing things with such a slow computer. And, um, well, let me introduce you analog computing, because there, uh, there's a kind of a community which think that the brain is actually what classically was done with classical analog computing. So analog computing is um, not 
the, the name does not come from analog like analog electronics, but more from analog like um, building analogies to mathematical systems. And here's such an analogy with water. So imagine you have two rivers and they are joining and you have long, some, some water coming from the, um, one river and from the other, let's call it A and B. And then, well, within the first approximation, if you neglect that water is somewhat lost in, 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 in the floor and wherever, um, what is coming out is obviously the sum of the two, uh, of, the, of the water, <laughs> of the, um, well, the flow, let's call it the flow, um, of these two rivers. And exactly the same is happening in electronic systems. And in physics, we call this um, conservation of streams, or basically of energy or mass. And in, in electrical circuits, you have this with electrons. It's called the Kirchhoff's law. And um, you have the fact that all the, the currents incoming at a certain point are summing. And nature is doing this for you. And you can exploit it without any further dough. You don't have to invent carry ripple adders. You don't have to invent a processor, a arithmetic logical unit. You just sum electrical currents, and you're done. And by using these principles, you can basically um, do all the fundamental um, arithmetic operations, such as plus, minus, multiplication, division, and so on. But it's not done on digit level, like with digital computers, um, so digit per digit, but it's really done on our representation of a quantity, of a measurement quantity, with a certain uncertainty. It's basically comparable to an experiment. And this was done in the past, and it's kind of an um, approach which is nowadays lost. So it's probably a good thing that we're today here in the German uh, Museum, Deutsches Museum, because this, uh, there's a kind of a technology which is nowadays really put into the museums, which are analog computers from the 1950s, 60s, 70s. And they were computing with this analog approach of building analogies to mathematical equations. And we're talking about differential equations here. So it's really uh, kind of calculus which they, they are capable of. And this sounds very special purpose, isn't it? So what were these computers used for? So for simulations, for instance, for, um, for scientific and industrial computations, so it's not that you would uh, do word processing, text processing with such a kind of a computer, at least not in the past. And the thing is that we, uh, it's just our far, well, there were the four of us, we were founding a company and we are thinking that we can bring this classical analog computing approach to modern day. So we can basically uh, rewind or fast forward the time and, and um, take up all the missed evolution of this computer technology in terms of microscopication and, and integration on a single chip. So at first we built classical analog computers and these are modern day computers but still with cables, patch cables. So you basically um, you have a patch panel and um, you have a, a number of uh, elementary operations um, which are possible or, uh, on this um, patch panel, like uh, summers, adders, integrators, multipliers, and so on. And you can map your, your equation onto this patch panel just by putting in patch cables. And this is a classical way how analog computing was done. And so uh, the, the most interesting thing here from an uh, information theoretical point is that it's really a, a machine which has an intrinsic parallel data flow. So everything in this machine is happening at the same time. It's not like a digital computer where you have serial information processing one after the other, but we are really a, a, the, the perfect parallel computer. There's nothing which you can do better in terms of parallel computing if you don't go to quantum. This is comp um, very energy efficient because you don't waste energy for doing cycles or doing memory lookup or anything because this computer has no memory basically. And the, um, the representation of values and time is continuous in this computer because, uh, well, as I said in the before, with the energies, for instance, with water, so there's no digital representation in terms of digits, but everything is continuous, basically. And there's no clock, and this makes this computer very energy efficient on an, uh, of an, on an extreme level because we waste a lot of energy with the digital clock cycles. Um, Interestingly, from a scientific point of view, analog and digital is quite complementary. So where you have on a digital computer which is very exact, very general purpose, and um, so on, it's, it's really intrinsically serial. It's very hard to write parallel programs. And this computer is comparably high energy consuming with the kind of operations it does. In comparison, an analog computer is really kind of economical because it's completely parallel. 
and it's also very fault tolerant in terms of uh, if you do something wrong in the quotation and, and fast due to the periodic um, uh, nature. However, it's quite inexact. So the exactness of your analog computer really depends very tightly on the hardware you have. So if you have some very good hardware doing uh, well, very precise electronics, for instance, you get much better results than if you have very cheap hardware, which is not the case with digital computers where you try to, um, to build your hardware as cheap as possible. It's completely the opposite. But I, on the other hand, so analog computing is quite special purpose, and I want to go into detail now what are these purposes, which are actually in the end are quite interesting today. So um, how does analog computing behave to other technologies we are discussing today, which are very present here on, on this fair today? Um, let's talk about artificial intelligence. I mean, I already said it before with the brain. So there is a um, lot of people thinking that neurons can be understood as little analog computers. Um, all neurons in the brain are working there on, on, on parallel, basically exchanging currents on electricity. And basically, analog CMOS technology is quite the best we can do if we want to build artificial neural networks. And there are a lot of people thinking that we only really can do a progress with artificial intelligence if we step back from digital processing. This also includes tensor processing units and all this. What you're so well known of today with, uh, with high-end uh, AI applications, but instead really adopt for different uh, um, approaches. And there's a whole branch of engineering called neuromorphic computing. I mean, there's only a, a, a small fraction here uh, shown of uh, approaches which, is, uh, which are chosen for how to build a computer which more works like the brain. Another keyword in this respect is, for instance, in-memory computing. So that you have um, that you uh, uh, neglect the architecture uh, for Neumann architecture, which you have so present in digital computing today, but instead uh, bring together memory and computation in a in a very close fashion, and th which is actually the same as you have with neurons. And um, so this is a thing where there are also a lot of research and also startups working in this field trying to get a more efficient way of how to do, uh, how to compute um, neural networks. It's both in respect of training and of course evaluation at one point. And um, this, I mean, this is interesting if you want to save energy and if you want to be fast, basically. So another topic which is very high, very, uh, very much into presence, even today here I see already a si small, uh, number of signs here with, uh, dealing with quantum computing, is the fact that there's a, a lot of people hoping that quantum computing will really bring us uh, an advantage in computing, and I think it is a case because we can't neglect quantum um, advances on a theoretical level. The, the problem is how can we get them practically? So when is it that we have a quantum computer which is really uh, usable at a large scale with a large number of qubits with really good error correction and, and all that? And the thing is that, at least from my point of view, and uh, the technological readiness of this t uh, approaches are very co comparably low. In respect, analog computing is done since decades, is completely understood. It just has to be carried out. And there's another interesting, uh, t uh, well, scientific domain called quantum-inspired classical computing or quantum-inspired analog computing, which is adopting quantum algorithms and computing them with non-quantum computers, which is quite funny because actually you have almost everything you need except of um, entanglement because you can't sim well, you can simulate entanglement of course but then you still have the exponential um, degrees of freedom which you have to map you can't you can get around of that but there are a lot of approaches thinking for instance of an eating problems eating problems or also quantum algorithms like Shor algorithms which don't need entanglement and this is quite interesting because you can actually get a lot of traction from what is done in the quantum world, but do it and carry it out on computing technology, which is major, which is just working today. And there, there are a lot of other um, up, um, applications where analog computing in the future really can make a future, can make any difference. And the, the important step is miniaturization. So we somehow we need to be uh, able to do and compress this bulky old hardware of large trunks and large cases into very small chips. 
And once we are able to do that, we will have a chip which is reconfigurable, which is, can be um, programmed by a digital computer. And then we can basically embed it virtually everywhere. And because it's so exceptionally energy saving, there are a lot of applications where nowadays it's really hard to uh, get progress with microprocessor units put on, uh, on the site. Um, and I, I put two examples here. The one is like energy harvesting that you don't want to uh, keep an, uh, um, an energy source at the point where you compute, but instead really uh, try to consume so much little energy that you can just uh, harvest energy from your uh, our, well, the rear outside, which is interesting in medical technologies, but also in Internet of Things and, and all that. Um, and another example here is from another startup which are doing um, always listening, always on um, artificial intelligence solutions. So the thing that you want, basically have, think of Siri or Alexa standing at the side of your, uh, in your living room, and you want to have it always listening to your comments. And, um, but you don't want to consume it so much energy. And there's a simple approach just um, by implementing some of the artificial uh, network with an analog technology. And once there's a certain trigger, then you ramp up and start the digital processor to do all the heavy lifting and all the actual work. So it's, uh, can think of a pre-processor stage which just reduce the overall power consumption. Okay, so what we are at Annabred, we are a startup in Germany located in Ulm, in Berlin, and in Frankfurt, and uh, we want to bring this old technology to a microchip. So there's like, uh, like all the wires, we won't get rid of them. We will use crossbar architectures to um, basically matrices to where you can flip little switches to, um, to build something which is similar to a field programmable gate array, but instead of gates, we will use analog uh, operation amplifiers basically. And, um, and as I said, it's from a perspective of analog computing, we call this a general purpose analog computing chip, but general purpose on a perspective of, uh, well, of digital computing is probably a special purpose and because the applications are, are quite um, limited on, on certain um, areas, as I just told. Um, and just to pick up the topic I said in the very beginning, so, um, I say today that, de um, that year 22, we, we start the decade of giga scale analog computing. We will see an economic of scale in analog computing that we, um, that we perceive something similar as with digital computing, where you see like the size of the, um, of the transistors went down exponentially within decades. And you, we, we basically, um, what, what took 70 years in digital computing, we will do in a few years in analog computing. And um, by this means, really be able to integrate a huge number of analog computing elements. And if you just compare what was done so far, it's like uh, having an analog computer uh, being able to compute 100 sums, for instance. It was an ma absolute maximum, because an analog computer scales with, an, uh, with the size of an equation. And this is quite laughable. If you think in digital computing, you just write a for loop and you can compute as many sums as you want. Because you can do it uh, one after the, the other, but it's not possible in analog computing. And that's why I think um, if you want to get a feeling for these numbers, it's, uh, it's basically comparable to the degrees of freedom in, a, in an artificial neural network, where nowadays we are about 10 to the 12 um, with very, very large scale applications like what um, Yunus Androulis is presenting um, in the theater above. And um, I think this is quite possible to get to uh, 10 to the 9 within a few years and even beyond then. Um, so, but that's one thing I want to introduce you today. Um, and it's a, a thing we well, built for, for getting people more familiar with the analog paradigm. And this is a small learning computer. And I even brought it to stage today. Um, it's called the analog thing. It's, uh, it's very small, actually, not, not that big. It's quite, uh, you could call it a handheld computer. So um, it's actually a computer we built to be affordable because analog electronics is expensive just because it's uh, very high precision electronics. And um, we made some tricks here to get this more in the price range, which is affordable by students because we want to bring it to educational purposes and to to open the hardware, open source community um, to people who are um, nowadays working with Raspberry Pis or Arduinos. And um, 
basically, with, with such a thing, you would require an oscilloscope, but we, you can also use this without one. So it's really um, meant to be get a, an idea, to get, an, um, to get a first touch with how analog electronic is working. And so if you want, uh, we are making a workshop at 11 a.m. So like, in, uh, I think it's just after my talk today, um, over there at the workshop area, and you can really get t uh, hands on with this device. And we have a small guidebook, and you can just uh, play around with the computer and get a feeling how it's working. So just to say what, what is on this computer, um, it's really very tiny. So it has like uh, two multipliers. You can do two multiplications with this computer. It has five uh, uh, summers, so you can do five sums. You can basically think of a differential equation containing, uh, yes, five sums if you want. So um, we are, uh, you can solve, use this for solving a single neuron, for instance, or for simulating a small and body problem in physics um, or similar ones, we, uh, uh, or tractors, for instance, all, all kind of small uh, toy problems, which you also can easily solve numerically on your laptop. But this is not a computer to perform, but more to inspire, to get a feeling for how you would program an analog computer. And um, this shows uh, how this works. So you basically have a set of differential equations. You map them on a circuit. You, you somehow wire it. You, um, you put some cables to, for instance, your computer if you don't have an oscilloscope, and simulate it and run it. So you can think of analog computing actually as running a small physical experiment and um, in a very controlled environment. So it's like a, a lab on your table, uh, doing experiments with, with just electronics, nothing fancy, um, very simple stuff. And uh, yeah, this is kind of a black box thing, um, shipping you um, black box units which can do some basic um, operations. So if you want to learn about analog computing, we have a vast amount of resources on our website. For instance, there's a video by Viritasium who's also explaining how the analog thing is working and um, why analog computing and this weird and uh, somewhat grumpy approach of computing is about to make a comeback in these times. And uh, well, yes, thank you for your attention. And I also thank uh, the um, German um, agency for a leap innovation sprint um, for funding the, the German Aerospace Institute DLR, which is sitting over there for, uh, <laughs> well, not these guys in particular, but the overall agency. And um, so we are very happy to get into contact with you in the workshop area if you want. And I think we also have a, a bit time for questions. So if there's questions in the audience, then I think we should, uh, you should raise them now. You said that the progress in digital computers lasted 70 years, and you're going to achieve similar progress with analog computing in very few years. How can you be so sure of that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, my, my point is that we don't need to go like to four nanometers structure, but uh, like 60 nanometers, so we can use processes which uh, have a lot of experience since our years, and that also makes it cheap, a very good cheap and um, not that much challenge if you want to do, uh, catch up with the latest integration of the digital equity. But nevertheless, um, we have a lot of experience in how to do it in things, and um, so that's why we can think we can do our prototype in a very short time. And the um, thing is, if, if you don't do it in fast time, I think then there's no much point to do it anyway, because it, it, you can probably will have cotton in place in 15 or 20 years, no, people are thinking differently about the some day that this would be a few years. I think analog computing can, at the very first point, be a bridge technology um, to really close the gap between where you have a computing everywhere. And in the end, um, it will be also beyond the technology, uh, which is probably more portable and not that much challenging on, on the environmental aspects as well. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, maybe? Anybody? Okay, then I would like to thank you so much for your talk here and uh, telling us what the future of analog computing brings to us. And like you said, uh, you can head over to the workshop space over there and you can get your hands and try out how it actually functions. Uh, so if you have signed up, you can go and you'll get 
like priority, but uh, I think there's still some spots available, so you can have a look if there's a free, a free chair. Thank you so much. Thank you.